Welcome to our first webinar of the USDA Foods Processing from Soup to Nuts series. Today we'll be discussing processing agreements. Now before we jump into today's content, we do have a couple of questions for you. We'd like to learn a little bit more about our audience today. And our first question asks, where do you work? So it looks like we have about a third of you from the school level, um, the most of our attendance today, as well as about a quarter from states and 20% from USDA, as well as having some processors represented. So we're glad all of you are able to join us today, and we hope that in whatever role you're in, you'll learn some things from today's presentation. And now for an overview, we have two speakers joining us today to share their expertise on this topic. Kylie Larson, a program analyst in the policy branch, will be discussing types of processing agreements and general requirements. And following that, Kathleen Staley, the Chief of the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch, will further delve into some roles and responsibilities. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the first webinar in our series of processing webinars. So thanks for joining us. And we hope our material is useful. And we appreciate your feedback. So today, Kylie and I are going to spend some time focused on the types of processing agreements and the general requirements. Kylie's really going to focus in on the regulations. And then I will close out talking about roles and responsibilities. So today, we are talking what is further processing so that we're all on the same page. So it's a state distributing agency and schools can contract with commercial food processors to convert raw bulk USDA foods into ready-to-use end products. And this program was developed to really help provide you, the users, the end products that you can use. So fully cooked beef patties, meatballs, crumbles, cooked fajita strips, macaroni and cheese, marinara sauce, bagged apples, bagged apple slices, and applesauce. So the purpose of agreements. The agreements set forth obligations under which a processor may utilize USDA foods to manufacture and deliver specified end products to state distributing agencies or eligible recipient agencies to ensure the return of quantity, quality, and value of USDA foods diverted for processing. The processor agrees to fully account for all USDA food delivered into its possession for processing or carried forward from a previous school year. And by producing and delivering end products requested by the state distributing agencies or recipient agencies. As with any contractual agreement, the processing agreement is designed to protect the interests of all parties involved and you will hear a lot more details on that throughout the presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Kylie Larson to talk to you about the types of processing agreements and general requirements. Yes, and thank you, Kathy, for providing that overview. And before Kylie begins, we do have one more polling question for you. Does your state procure processing services? And so it looks like about half of you answered a yes to that question. 20% no, and about 20% don't know. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Kylie to discuss the types of processing agreements and general requirements. Great, thank you. So my name is Kylie, and I'm going to be talking about the types of processing agreements and the general requirements contained in those agreements. So processors play a very important role in FNS programs. However, in order to receive USDA-donated foods and process them into finished end products for state and recipient agencies, Processors must be a party to and adhere to the provisions of applicable processing agreements. FNS fully implemented national processing agreements for school year 2007 to reduce and streamline the administrative paperwork burden for state distributing agencies entering into processing agreements on behalf of their schools. There are two basic types of processing agreements in use today, national processing agreements and in-state processing agreements. Most processors participate under the National Processing Agreement. The State Participation Agreement is an integral component of the National Processing Agreement that is used to convey state-specific information to the processor. 
More details on these agreements are to follow. A National Processing Agreement, or NPA, is required for all multi-state processors. A multi-state processor is a commercial entity doing business in one or more than one state or doing business in a state other than where the processor's office or production facility are located. The National Processing Agreement program allows processors to create a single set of agreement documents for further processing that is recognized in all states. This agreement contains the provisions that permit processors to receive and utilize USDA foods as an ingredient in the production of finished end products. In return, the processor agrees to pass the value of the USDA foods through to the recipient agency in the form of a lower cost end product. FNS has set up the NPA at fns.usda.gov general mailbox to accept new national processing agreements and related documents. Existing processors also use this mailbox to submit required documentation, such as new and revised end product data schedules and monthly performance reports. New processor NPAs are accepted at any time. Agreement approval time is dependent on many factors, including the number of end products and the types of USDA foods to be processed. And now it's time for our next polling question. How many multi-state processors does your state do business with? The responses with the highest number of votes are 10 to 25 MPA processors and 26 or more. As we discuss national processing agreements, it's important to understand what an NPA is not. An NPA is not a competitively procured contract for processed end products. The entity selecting the processor and purchasing processed finished products, aka the recipient agency or state distributing agency, is responsible for conducting a competitive procurement in accordance with 2 CFR 200 and relevant state procurement rules. Also, an NPA is not a guarantee that USDA donated foods will be shipped to the processor. State distributing agencies have the responsibility to collect recipient agency and school requests for USDA food diversions for processing. Many states require a minimum of one full truck of USDA foods before submitting food orders to USDA. There is also no guarantee that USDA will be able to purchase requested raw material based on availability and market conditions. An NPA is also not a contract template. Procuring entities must draft solicitation documents and contracts for finished end products based on federal program and procurement regulations and relevant state procurement rules, which will include many provisions that are not included in the NPA. In other words, program and procurement regulations may include many requirements that are not included in the NPA and procuring entities such as recipient agencies and state distributing agencies must therefore reference both resources in order to be fully compliant. MPA is also not an endorsement of a processor by FNS. FNS does its best to screen new processors prior to entering into processing agreements and stay abreast of market and financial changes that could heavily impact a particular industry segment. The state distributing agencies should notify FNS of any problems arising during the term of an agreement, including, but not limited to, end product shortages, delivery problems, delinquent monthly performance reports, or inadequate reports. One of the constituent parts of the NPA covers substitution. The NPA references requirements contained in 7 CFR 250.30 and relevant policy regarding processing and handling procedures. These procedures must coincide with the category of USDA donated foods. These include fully substitutable, limited substitutable, and non-substitutable donated foods. The NPA also covers end product data schedules. For those newcomers to USDA donated food processing, an end product data schedule, aka an EPDS, is a standard form that is used to describe each finished end product being produced. The USDA approved end product data schedule and resulting summary end product data schedule and instructions are an integral part of the National Processing Agreement. Once approved, EP 
CCDSs are permanently approved until such time that the product is discontinued by the processor or the formulation of the end product changes. If a CN label is obtained, the information on the EPDS must be based on the product formulation used by the processor to obtain the label. A standard EPDS template is available. Specifically, EPDSs require detailed end product descriptions, product formulations, including specific USDA foods to be utilized, end product yields and returns, in other words, the quantity of donated food needed to produce a specific number of units of end product. Specific details to complete the EPDS are contained in the EPDS instructions. FNS staff is available to answer questions and assist in the completion of EPDSs. In order to protect the proprietary product formulations contained in an EPDS, Relevant non-proprietary data is transferred to a summary end product data schedule for distribution to state distributing agencies with the state participation agreement that we'll cover in a minute. The state distributing agency can designate specific commodities and end products that can be produced and sold to eligible recipients on the summary end product data schedule. Each November, FNS emails existing processors an approval schedule for new and revised EPDSs. Additions or changes to EPDSs and summary end product data schedules are not accepted during June and July. FNS uses this time to ensure that all end product data schedule requests are processed prior to July 1st, which is the start of a new school year. EPDSs also cover the value of donated foods, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than is contained in the National Processing Agreement document itself. Historically, FNS has used the last purchase price per pound paid prior to November 15th of each year to value USDA foods diverted for further processing. However, after extensive analysis, FNS changed the last purchase price to a 12-month calculated average purchase price for each USDA food. The average price file for processors is still issued around the middle of each November, so some may still refer to this date as the November 15th file or the November file price. The average prices are issued in November for the school year beginning July 1st of the next year. So seven months in advance of the school year, the value of USDA food is known before schools go out to bid for processed end products and submit food requisitions to their state agency. The average price file is the established value for a particular USDA food diverted for processing for the entire school year. This value is used for discount and rebate value pass-through systems, including net off invoice, which is shown on the approved summary end product data schedule. Some may refer to the value as the pass-through value. The value is used when a processor under yields and needs to pay for the value of missing cases or experiences loss, damage, or condemnation during the production process. FNS also uses this value to determine surety bond amounts and to determine when a CPA audit is due from processors. Some of the other notable items contained in the National Processing Agreement are listed on this slide. They include the allowable value pass-through systems, inspection and grading requirements, performance reporting, record keeping, audit requirements that we'll go into a little bit more detail later, insurance, and processing arrangements. One of the major components of the NPA is inventory protection. All multi-state processors are subject to inventory protection requirements to protect the value of USDA donated foods. FNS monitors the processor's national inventory of USDA donated foods. Inventory protection requirements are contained in Food Distribution Memo FD-134 dated March 2014 and entitled Minimum Inventory Protection Requirements for Processors Participating in the National Processing Program. FNS holds and manages the processor's performance bond or letter of credit, which protects the value of the processor's donated food inventories. 
FNS accepts surety bonds from any company listed in the Treasury Circular 570 or a letter of credit. FNS provides required temperate language for each of these documents. New processors must provide inventory protection to cover 100% of the value of USDA foods received in the first year. Existing processors must maintain inventory protection equal to 75% of the value of their highest monthly inventory of the previous year. These thresholds, again, are dictated in FD 134 and not in the NPA itself. Effective school year 2014 to 2015, processors with a national processing agreement that have participated in the processing program for one school year or more must maintain minimum inventory protection equal to 75% of the value of their highest monthly inventory in the 12 months beginning December of the previous school year. Following is the approved method for calculating the minimum required inventory protection levels. You must multiply by 75% the dollar value calculated using the average price report for further processed foods for the school year to be converted by the bond. Multiply by 75% the dollar value of the processor's highest monthly ending inventory during the 12 months beginning December of the previous school year and ending November of the current school year. For processors in their first year of participation in the processing program, inventory protection must be obtained before receiving USDA foods. Again, for first year participation, this inventory protection must be sufficient to cover 100% of the value of the USDA foods the processor will receive in their first year. Processors must work with states and recipient agencies to maintain appropriate inventory levels and reduce excessive inventories on hand, which will help reduce their inventory protection requirements in the future. Further guidance on managing inventories can be found in the policy memorandum FD064 entitled Management of Donated Food Inventories at Processors. The NPA also includes the audit requirements. Processors must obtain an independent CPA audit based on the value of the USDA donated foods received annually. A year is defined as a school year that begins July 1st and ends the following July 30th. These audits are due to FNS by December 31st of each year. FD 102 issued on February 4th of 2010 and entitled Waiver and Replacement of Current Regulatory Thresholds for Independent CPA Audits of Multi-State Processors establishes the dollar thresholds that trigger the audit in line with current inventory levels. Under the old thresholds, all but the smallest further processors were subject to an annual audit. The existing thresholds are seen here. A processor must obtain a CPA audit annually if they receive more than $5 million per year in USDA foods. Every two years if they receive between $1 million and $5 million, and every three years if they receive less than $1 million of USDA donated foods each year. That concludes our discussion of the National Processing Agreements. So we'll move on to state participation agreements. Individual state distributing agencies desiring the processor's finished end products have the option to participate in the national processing agreement by signing a state participation agreement with the processor. The state participation agreement is a required agreement between a multi-state processor and a state distributing agency. This document is used in conjunction, not in place of, the National Processing Agreement. The State Participation Agreement is an integral part of the process to convey state-specific information to the processor. A basic template is available that each state can customize to meet their needs. The State Participation Agreement identifies relevant contacts for the state distributing agency and processor for management of processing activities. The SPA also indicates which value pass-through methods may be used in the state. 
Other provisions of the state participation agreement include the allowance of backhauling, a list of eligible recipient agencies, and labeling and nutritional information. Processors submit the USDA-approved summary end product data schedules to states along with the completed state participation agreement. The processor has the ability to hide items from the summary end product data schedule that are not available in specific states. The state also has the option to accept or reject individual products listed on the summary end product data schedule. And in the case of multiple USDA foods available for processing, they may accept or reject certain USDA foods for processing in their state. The state also selects the effective date when end products may be sold and inventory reductions may occur. The processor may submit an updated summary end product data schedule to the state for approval whenever new items are added or existing end products are revised. Other state-specific requirements included in the state participation agreement include special instructions for delivery of end products to designated delivery locations, such as a state warehouse, that could include minimum case or pallet quantities. Also, a requirement that the processor may be able to track individual recipient agency inventory balances electronically on monthly performance reports. And now our next polling question, how many in-state processors do you do business with? The answers are pretty evenly distributed among several of these categories. Looks like about a quarter of you answer none, a little over that, less than five, and for some of you this is not applicable, with fewer of you selecting the options of five to ten or more than ten. In-state processing agreements are agreements between an in-state processor and a state distributing agency. Recall that an in-state processor is a commercial entity doing business exclusively in one state and where the processor's offices and production facilities are located in the same state. An in-state processing agreement is used in place of a national processing agreement and state participation agreement. This document is managed by state distributing agencies, often using a template. We won't go into too much depth with in-state processing agreements because they often mirror requirements contained in the national processing agreement. However, this document does not release processors from key regulatory requirements. One major difference from the national processing agreement is that with an in-state processing agreement, the state distributing agency monitors processors' state inventory of USDA donated foods and holds and manages the processor's performance bond or letter of credit, which protects the value of the processor's donated food inventories. All right, thank you so much, Kylie, for explaining the various types of processing agreements and a lot of the details contained within those. And now we have another polling question before Kathy begins the second part of today's presentation. The question is, how often do you review your contracted processor's facility? Thank you for submitting your answers. It looks like about two-thirds of you selected the last option that you never review their facilities, and a few of you do before signing an agreement. And now Kathy will explain more about the various roles and responsibilities. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about the role of Food and Nutrition Service Food Distribution Division, specifically my branch, the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch, then we'll talk about the roles and responsibility of the state distributing agency, the school, and the processor. The relatively new branch, Program Integrity and Monitoring, is the branch responsible for making sure that we have signed national processing agreements on file here in the national office. We are the group that the processing team review the end product data schedules and the summary schedules. We work to review the bond levels and those letters start, the bond levels start being calculated the end of February, the letters going out, the bonds are required in by May 13th. So we hold the bonds or the letters of credit and we are working with the operations branch to monitor the monthly performance report to make sure that the processor 
maintains inventory, the bond covers their inventory on hand. Very important part is we maintain a list of approved processors on the USDA website. We monitor, as I said earlier, uh, looking at the bond levels, the processor inventory. We're trying to make sure that they do not exceed the six-month supply. And then you see a little asterisk. One of the new functions with Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch is working with the operations branch who does the ordering of the food. They're the ones that review the monthly performance reports. The Program Integrity Monitoring Branch staff is going to randomly pull some of those monthly performance reports and make sure that everything is in order. So the state distributing agency, as Kylie mentioned earlier, provides the STA to the processors, and then they are the ones that communicate to the school districts the approved processors, and they are, provide the allocation of entitlements to the schools. They're monitoring the monthly performance reports and tracking the entitlement value. So the school has a very important role because they're the ones that have to make sure that the food that is at the processor is being pulled. So they submit the orders to the state. They're tracking their purchases because they want to make sure that they are being credited at the right value pass through. They're monitoring their orders to the processor Again, making sure that we're staying within that threshold of a six-month inventory and that there is a signed agreement if they have a contract with the distributor to store and de deliver their donated USDA foods. And now our next polling question asks, what is the most important benefit you receive by participating in further processing? And the answer with the most votes is that it stretches your USDA food dollars with a little over 40% selecting this option, followed closely by a third of you saying that you can receive the end products that you want. And that's the most important benefit you receive. So I hope you appreciate, because we certainly do, the time you take to fill out our polling questions because that provides valuable information to help us look at our programs. So thank you for taking the time to answer our polling questions. Next, we're going to talk about what are the responsibilities of the processor. So a processor will submit their signed national processing agreement to the program integrity monitoring, along with their description of how their quality control system for how they manage the foods in their facilities. Part of the agreement is that they, the processor will transport, handle, store product in a safe and sanitary manner at recommended temperature of the specific product. The processor is the one that is financially liable for the value of USDA donated foods in their inventory. Hence, that's why they put bond or letter of credit on file. It's always that we're looking to protect the value of the USDA foods. So the processor works to notify the states of their participation in the agreement. We get calls on a daily basis from companies interested in participating in the national processing agreement, and it usually takes some time for them to build up customers. So they're out there marketing their products. They request from the state the SPA, the STA, and they provide a list of their participating states and each state's inventory level. And then the most important thing is that monthly performance report to the states and to food distribution. It's required that processors maintain all records connected with the National Processing Agreement for three years. And now our final polling question for the day asks, which bulk USDA donated food do you most frequently send to a processor? And the majority of you selected chicken at about 54%, followed by cheese and beef. I'd like to point out um, there are some valuable resources for those of you that are new 
or have not participated in the national processing program, the American Commodity Distribution Association has a wealth of information on their website, as well as the Institute of Child Nutrition has a very good online course of USDA Foods Processing 101. And for all of the information, you can refer to our webpage, USDA National Processing Agreement, and there is the website. Yes, we appreciate all of you joining us today and hope you will continue to participate in the rest of our series. We'll now open the floor up for questions that we hope you're submitting through the Q&A tab on live meeting. So, um, Lindsay, we have a question about state processor audits um, in state. What audit procedures are in place? Does each state determine when audits are due by the processor's independent auditor and the frequency of those audits? For state processing agreements, the state is required to do an on-site review of each of the processors, and they would probably visit at least half of their processors each year. It appears there's some confusion. So the question was audits of um, if it was a state participation agreement. So the state will be conducting on-site reviews of those processors. Or in-state processing in agreements. In-state, yes. So a question came in, can the state set a deadline for approving a SPA? Yes. Um, another question has come in, can um, state distributing agencies share the summary end product data schedules with RAs? Yes. What is backhauling? Backhauling is when products are delivered to a state contracted warehouse or to a recipient agency, and then a manufacturer goes to that location and picks up that product and brings it back to the facility and manufactures it into end products. So we received another question, how is the value per pound of commodity determined on the summary end product data schedule? We're going to have Sherry answer that question from our program integrity and monitoring branch. Good afternoon, everyone. I thought I got all the language covered on that slide that Kylie presented for the average price file. Um, the, that is the value of the commodity that's shown on the summary end product data schedule. It's, you know, it's calculated based on that 12-year average of our actual purchase prices. And it is updated every school year. So um, we have another question. Um, what do you recommend for states who approve processors and end product data um, schedules but do not procure processors or end products on behalf of the RAs? Is um, it the state's responsibility to be ensuring that RAs are properly procuring processed products? An emphatic yes. is how does the state agency audit the distributor? The state agency does an annual physical inventory that's required by regulations and reconciles and reports that to the, north, to the regional offices. There's also, um, each state agency can do it differently, have daily shipping files sent to them, do communications on a weekly basis, but to monitor inventories, a state agency does often work directly with the, with the distributor to ensure that there's the inventory is being properly drawn down on. But if the processed product is procured by a recipient agency, the state agency does not audit or control that. That's done between the recipient agency and the distributor that they choose. Does a subcontractor have to sign the EPDS or SEPDS because a processor receives cheese and sends that cheese to a sandwich maker to make sandwiches? The processor isn't doing anything. So how does a subcontractor get involved? And so this is another question we'd like to have Sherry answer. Okay, no problem. Um, so attached to the national processing agreements, sometimes our, our manufacturers do have subcontractors that perform a portion of the production on their behalf, and we call those subcontractors. 
the subcontractor and the primary processor are both required to sign the end product data schedule, documenting the actual formulation and what that subcontractor is doing on behalf of that processor. The subcontractor is not required to sign the summary end product data schedule. That's only the primary processor. Thank you all for joining us on today's webinar.